we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a pattern of soul, where every bird and beast and tree is a soul maker. And we've forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a moving feast of stars, footprints, scales, and beginnings. Since when we become afraid of the night and that only the bright stars count, or that our moon is not a moon and yet it is full. By whose command were the animals through groping fingers, one for each hand, reduced to the big and the little fire? And we've forgotten that every creature is within us, carried by tides of earth and blood, and that we named them. We've forgotten. Wilderness is not a place, but a season. And we are in its final hour. I really feel emotional every time I hear that poem of Ian's. Now, Ian McCullum is my next interlocutor in this series to distill wisdom in the midst of the COVID 19 pandemic. And he's going to reflect in a recent article that he published. It's titled, an ecological and psychological perspective on the year 2020, subtitled A Reflection on the Year in Which Our Basic Assumptions About Our Future Would Be Challenged. It's doing the rounds and I'm hoping that this video can help promote it because it has some really profound insights. Ian's an old friend of mine and I'm very privileged to have him to reflect on that and just a bit about the guy. Besides being a poet, he is a deep ecologist, a wilderness guide, a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, and a Jungian analyst. <laughs> now that really does give you a sense that this man is quite unique. Back in 2005, he wrote a book, Ecological Intelligence, Rediscovering Ourselves in Nature. Well, it was that book which helped launch and sustain me in my work with the Amman Ponder on the Ponderland Wild Coast. Because apart from that whole adventure being an outward bound type of experience, it's been very challenging and also been an inward bound process of me having to own my own story and live my life consciousness of a much larger mystery of life. It's not just, it wasn't just about being a social worker and an activist. It was about a journey. It was about something of a pilgrimage. And over the years I've regularly sought Ian's wisdom and counsel as the tensions and conflicts in what's really been a clash between human rights and mining rights have escalated. Now if you want to know what that's all about, check the notes and there's this link now showing uh, as a card and you can get the full backstory there. Well Ian's influence helped nerve me against panic and seduction and it helped me keep perspective to realise that the local story of the Amman Ponder was in fact emblematic of the conflict between the human species and the earth at a global level that's playing out and to make sure that in my work, I did not forget those words from his poem, that every creature is within us, carried by tides of earthly blood, and we named it. Ian's poetry is really extraordinary, and at the end of this conversation, I'm going to ask him to recite another poem that I read whenever there's a birth and or death in my large tribe of a family and amongst my friends. But before I ask Ian to share his wisdom, I have a surprise. You might have noticed another face here on my screen. Well, that's my friend from Melbourne, Australia, Leslie Shuttleworth. And Leslie grew up on the wild coast and it became for her too, a place for the evolution of her own ecological intelligence. And although she has been living in Melbourne for the past, I think, two decades or so, she still carries within her the wilderness of the wild coast. And as a consequence, she's been a source of huge solidarity to us, particularly in naming, unmasking and engaging the Australian powers that be, since it's an Australian mining company that has ambitions to domesticate and tame the wild coast. But before I invite Leslie to introduce herself, there's another good reason for inviting her 
and that's to make sure that Ian and I don't get sidetracked uh, talking about rugby intelligence. Because besides being a tough-minded medical scientist, a tender-hearted poet, and a steady-handed wilderness guide, Ian has another claim to fame. A devastating boot. Well, Ian is a former rugby fullback for the Springboks and in the late 60s and early 70s was a legendary place kicker. So Ian, <laughs> to as it were kick things off, tell us what your rugby career has done for you. Well, I think the first thing about, about, um, about rugby for me is that I had no choice in a way, having gone to a school where rugby was, was the, the main game. And to be recognized as a sportsman um, in my early upbringing, um, the first prize was to be recognized through this rugby mad country fashion uh, for, for the game. However, um, apart from the fact that I just love games of any sorts, I love to play, which seems to be intrinsic to, to my nature, you know, it, it took a, quite a while to really understand the value what this game meant to me, and really in a nutshell, the number of things about rugby and where I've been privileged enough to play at, at, at the highest level is that um, the, the number of friendships that I made along the way. I mean, rugby is, a, is, a, is far more than just a contact sport, it is a collision sport. I think it takes a certain kind of craziness. You want to play this game in the first place. But it is also a game which is going to demand a lot of hard work and certain de development of, of certain skills. So there are, there are mentors, there are coaches that come your way who believe in, in, in your talent, or that, that you have something in a game where you can't win them all. You win some and you lose some. And so it doesn't take long to realize that this game itself is, is not unlike life. You've got to enter into it. You've got to play the game. And then I think for me, probably one of the most important aspects of, of this game which is not confined just to rugby, is the paradox of what it means to be a team player. One, you're playing as a team, and the other, you're also playing as an individual. When you go out onto that field, you are on show. You cannot be or pretend to be someone else. You cannot wish you were somewhere else. You are right there. You are performing. You are utterly in your own skin. And here I was, in this game as a, as a fullback. To a large degree, is a highly specialized position. And I like that. Why? Because it, it focuses on the individuality of the player. So you have different positions in the field and demanding certain uh, levels of, of, of expertise which those particular individuals are best able to express. So on the one hand, here I am as an individual, but nothing happens until I know how to combine that individuality with, with teamwork. There's something deeply evolutionary in this, is that um, in order to survive as an individual, you need to develop certain skills, you need to be able to adapt to the changing uh, essences of, of, of the game or the process, and secondly, you're not going to make it without teammates. So it is a 90-minute expression, if you like, of, of an ancient paradox. Yes, you are unique as an individual but you will not survive until you know how to play in a team. For me, the highlight of last year wasn't so much the fact that the Springboks won the World Cup, but that Sonny Bill Williams was asked in an interview on television what, he, what was his sporting highlight. Now, he's an all black, for those of you who don't know. And he said his highlight of sporting in 2019 was to see Sia Kulisi lift that World Cup. He said it was like the happiest day of his life, despite the fact that the All Blacks didn't win. Say a bit about your own experience of that is in terms of what your opponents bring out of you. I can warm very, very much to, to that observation which came from Sonny Bill Williams. South Africa winning that cup um, last year was a magnificent demonstration of two, two important factors. One is, is the diversity, the diversity of that South African team in terms of, of 
not only the positions of the particular players, but the backgrounds and, and upbringings of these of, of the players. Diversity is strength. It demonstrated that in unity it is power. That was a game when, it, when everything went right for the South African team. They played as an absolute unit. And that is, that is the poetry. When you can combine the, diverse, the, the, the strength of the diversity with the, with the, the, the power of, um, of, of unity. So it's those feelings, it's those, those games, when, you, when, when even if it means for moments during that game, you capture that poetry, they all feed into the games that you will, that you will remember for the rest of your life. So it's not just it's not a very you know kind of unusual combination to have a poet being a rugby player because you see rugby as poetry. <laughs> okay, I'll take my rugby apparel off, <laughs> and we can now go to our topic for today. Leslie, introduce yourself to Ian and to the others, and and tell us tell him a bit about your sense of identity being connected to a river and just your experience about that. Um, so, Ian, I grew up in a little town called Harding in southern Natal. My grandparents lived at Mbizana, and I spent most of my childhood backwards and forwards between those places and the Wild Coast. A few years ago, I went back for a visit, and my sisters and I went back to Harding, and we drove out to the farm where we grew up. And you sort of drive along a ridge and down a steep hill and there's a little river, the Guapa. And as we drove down, we realised the river had dried up because, of all things, somebody had planted gum trees. And my youngest sister was aghast and she said, that can't happen. That river is us. I think that was the moment that I really realised a deeper truth in that saying, you are what you eat. And that quite literally, that river and that soil nurtured the food that we ate. It was the water that we drank. It built our bodies. For me, that was just another kind of layer of connecting which had started in childhood. My father was, I guess he would never have described himself that way, but very connected in nature. And I remember him saying we would learn more of God on the wild coast than we would in any church, and I think that was true. That power of just being in places like that was such an enormous gift and really fostered that sense of deep connection. Ian, tell us what your initiation into ecological intelligence was. I'm sure you've got many stories to tell, but what got your the popcorn popping for you? I think for me, um, a milestone event in, in, in my life occurred in the, in the early 1980s when I met um, Ian Player. I went on a trail with him, and this followed on a a joint presentation in Johannesburg where the two of us were, were, were presenting in what was in those days regarded as kind of um, alternative, alternative views on, on healing. Anyway, I was quite interested to hear what a, um, what a wilderness guide and game ranger would have to say about, about healing. And his particular subject was on the, uh, on the, on the, basically on the healing significance of, of nature. You know, and I love that concept, and I did, I did my degrees. But we resonated. Within a month, I was on my very first wilderness leadership trail in Infolozi, in, in the Tau. And very much like what Leslie has just said now, that I was not able to articulate what I'm going to tell you right now. But the feeling that I had when I entered into that wilderness area, that my God, I found my church. It mm. was just an, an impact, a, a sense of, of, of being at the very, very most a guest in an ancient temple. And I, I just happened to be, to be in it. It was a, a feeling that, is, that, that was profound. It has stayed with me. And as I say, I could not articulate this at that time. 
And it really was a kind of a reminder of how, how privileged I am and yet how small I, I am. I think there was something else which happened. And that is, over time, um, bearing in mind this was the launching pad, this exposure to, to, to wilderness, was a, a deeper understanding of kind of indifference of nature of wild animals. That a, that a buffalo wouldn't give a damn if I had to drop dead right there and then. It wouldn't give a damn. And I kind of liked that. I thought, you know what? That's just part of the way it is. However, mm -hmm. as a human being, I could give a damn if another animal died. Mm -hmm. And I kind of sense that as, a, as something which is that we do have a capacity to say, I do give a damn. And that indifference is really... One of the great sadnesses is in, in, in human behavior. So oh. there it is. Finding a church, and particularly a church with no dogma, that was wilderness. How old were you then, Ian? Were you finished as a doctor then, graduated? Yeah, I'd been qualified in medicine. I was, th I was about 30, 38 years of age. You know, that happened. And I have to pay tribute to you and Ian Player for establishing the Wilderness Leadership School because I was one of the first youngsters to be recruited to go and do an Omphalosi Wilderness Trail in 1973. I was 17 years old. It made me feel an entirely new sense of reality and the interconnectedness. The first stop after we starting our wilderness trail as we got out of our camp was to sit in a rhino midden and our ranger Don uh, Richards started off saying okay what you now see is a pile of shit let me start explaining to you how nature works. Now I'm giving that as a preface to this question about elephant. <laughs> And it occurred to me that, you know, we say that rather sort of cliched story about, you know, blind men describing an elephant. I love the fact in your TED talk in 2015, your understanding of the elephant was the shit trail that it left behind and what that did. In search of a renewed sense of sanity, I have turned to the animals and in this instance to the elephants. In 2012, following ancient elephant migratory routes and clusters, my great and close friend Ian Mickler and I undertook a 5,000 kilometer journey to six southern African countries. The objectives of our adventure were many, but for me the most important was this. If we cannot look after or understand an animal this big, how on earth are we going to look after the little things? And so, with the support of a solid backup team, we walked, and we cycled, and we kayaked across southern Africa. It did not take us long to realize that our journey had just as much to do with concerns over the future ways of life of indigenous peoples as it did the fate of our wild animals. And when it was over, I came away with a greater understanding of the meaning of the word keystone. Keystone species, creatures that are essential for maintaining the integrity of ecosystems. A keystone is a wedge-shaped stone in an arch. Remove that stone and the entire arch collapses. It is a powerful metaphor. Elephants are keystone species, so are bees, so are termites, so are, are beetles. It is in this light, therefore, that we need to look at shit differently. Take an elephant dung, for example. During the dry season, the moisture in elephant dung becomes a very important water source for countless species of insects, of butterflies and moths. The undigested seeds and grasses is a food source for baboons, for hornbills, guinea fowl, for Franklin, and the list goes on. Wherever an elephant walks is invariably a guarantee that it is the pathway to water used by other animals. And lest we forget that while elephants certainly have an impact on trees, they are ultimately 
among the greatest tree planters in Africa? The big question, of course, then was um, in human beings, are we a keystone species? Well, you know what the answer is to that. It is a profound no, we are not a keystone species. That if we had to disappear tonight, that nothing, nothing would miss us actually. <laughs> That's a, another story. And as you know, I, I don't sit too easy with that. It's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a sense of, 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 of a, something within me saying, damn it, how did I let this happen? How did we allow this to happen? And that is where, for me, the, the, the whole concept of hope becomes something which is really, really important. And I centered, I centered this around the notion of keystone individuals, that if we cannot be a keystone species, if we are not a keystone species, what about keystone individuals? Mm -hmm. And could this, in fact, be part of our evolution as a species? Could it be? Well, it might be the only chance we've got is to perhaps say yes to that, that challenge. Do you have it in you to be a keystone individual? Somebody who makes a difference to not just to, to your life, but the life of other living things. And out of this um, comes something which I think is going to be increasingly important, is that surely one of the, the great uh, um, requirements of a keystone individual is to be ecologically literate. To start mm. to really be able to read the signs of the times, to understand what they're about, to understand the deeper meanings of alarm calls, contact calls, all those kind of the, the, the um, everything to do with understanding the elements differently. Understanding, for example, that 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 the, the air that we breathe, the water that we we, we drink, the, the rivers. That's a beautiful, by the way, Leslie, that, that line, um, seeing that the, the river has dried up, yeah. that cannot happen. The river, the river is us. Mm -hmm. That is poetry. That is, it demands another line or two. Yeah. The river is us. The rivers, the oceans, the mountains, the soil, the sky, these are not aspects of human life. There are conditions of human life. Yes. Without them, we would not exist. And this is not just physiologically, it is psychologically. We would not exist. We need these rivers, we need the oceans, we need the mountains, we need clear days for the sake of our sanity. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Leslie, can you respond? Because I, the reason I wanted you to participate in this conversation is because I regard you as somebody who exemplifies a keystone individual. Oh my goodness. <laughs> in, in a minute, um, let me just say, in credit to you, um, mm. I've never met you face to face. I think people need to know this. You live in Australia, I live in South Africa. Nevertheless, because we come and we have a sense of identity from having, you know, spent time on the wild coast, it's mm. kind of help reshape our sense of identity. Mm. Um, and what I know what you're doing, and you put people in touch and they've come to South Africa and you've supported us and we've corresponded. The first thing is, as you were talking, Ian, I was thinking of Maya Angelou's beautiful poem, A Brave and Startling Truth. And the last line is that the, the brave and startling truth is that we, are the ones we've been waiting for. And, and it's such a beautiful way of offering that challenge and saying, you can't wait for someone else. You can't wait for something else. You can't just hope helplessly. Um, you're the one you've been waiting for. Now get on with it. You know, there's so much going on in the world that it's easy to despair, but and I think it's Margaret Wheatley who talks about hope. And she said, don't just sit and hope. You have to do the work that needs doing. So I think there's, there's a real calling to do that. Yeah. Uh, but then I also recently have been reading a lot of the work of Bio Akamolafe, 
he talks about becoming fugitive. And at first I really reacted to that and thought, no, you can't just go and hide and find a safe place. But I think he's talking about something more profound, about finding the other people that are fugitive from what's going on and going deeper into yourself and into what is happening. And then I watched something else where he was talking about you have to do both. You have to be fugitive from our destructive and brutalising culture, and I use that word deliberately, Um, but you also have to do the work that needs doing. Um, And, John, you asked that I I talk about what's going on in Australia um, ecologically, and it is just destruction. There's mining. Um, There now is another bid in New South Wales to mine uranium and people talking about nuclear energy, Um, even though we have more sun than you could ever wish for. The bushfires here are terrifying. And they're getting worse each year. I mean, every year the bush burns. That is the nature of the Australian bush. But the bit that most people who don't live here and most of the people who live here too don't understand is the Aboriginal people of Australia managed this land. And they burned that what they call cool burning. So they would burn the understory in cool conditions and didn't let that fuel load accumulate because gum trees have a massive fuel load on the ground. And also the oils um, are highly flammable. Somebody said it's like benzene, it just burns, really. The the oils are burning before the trees are burning. Um, But with... That the increasing heat of summer, the fires have just progressively got worse and worse and worse. And this last summer, we had fires that burned something like, it was more than a million hectares. They estimate that three billion animals died. And it was gut-wrenching to watch even though we were only watching on television, although there were fires close to us. Um, But again, that thing about the animals, and I told John about this, that the koalas really moved me because they actually, if you see koalas in the wild, they just sit up in a tree and do nothing. They're not the world's most exciting animal. But when the fires came, they came down and they went and they were knocking on people's doors asking for help. And they were going to firemen to get a drink of water. It was, it was heartbreaking. And there's this strange struggle that I don't think is unique to Australia, but it's everywhere, where you have those people who recognise what is going on and are utterly desperate to do something, and then others who persist. Our government still insists that coal is the beginning and end, and, you know, we have to have coal because we have to have industry. And, you know, bring coming back to the COVID idea, um, our family keeps talking about snapping back. You know, we have to get through this pandemic and just snap back to the way things were. And it seems as though they're not learning any of the lessons that are being shown to us so very clearly. And that's really the good the point of this whole conversation is about wisdom in the context of the Ian's article and ecological and psychological perspective on the year 2020, I'm part of a weekly Christian men's breakfast. And in our meeting last week, we were reflecting on how to respond constructively on on the Black Lives Matter and the suffocation of Floyd George under the boot of the policeman. And I'd shared your article with everyone. And 
Well, one of our guests, in fact, last week was Wilhelm Fulwut, who we invited to come and share his journey of having to challenge the status quo and the mindset, having been the grandson of H.F. Fulwut, and he's walked quite a significant path of sacrifice and and pain and suffering in the process. Um, in fact, I'd suggest he would be a good example of a keystone individual uh, in the larger sense of the word. One of the really challenging points to emerge from our breakfast was Wilhelm sharing uh, with us what his wife had shared with him, having she having grown up was Roman Catholic, and she'd been taught something which he said he had never learned to, taught in the Dutch Reformed theology. But it was that when Jesus hung on the cross, his actual final cause of death wasn't blood loss or broken bones. It was suffocation. That Jesus also, in effect, said, I can't breathe. Okay. If you don't mind, I, uh, part of my, my answer was going to, it will depend on right now, uh, capacity to gather myself, to gather the information which I've just heard from you in order to respond. And I'm linking this to what Leslie said about the fugitive. And if, we are fugitives. And I think it's important that we use this not as to describe individuals who are running away, but individuals who develop a ca capacity to, to, and a place in which you can gather yourself. And it could be a, a tangible place where you do this. It could be in the psyche. It could be a, something that you developed that, that allows you to, to gather yourself in order to come back and answer questions, deal with the situation is the way we're seeing it. So a fugitive then is not somebody who, tur who turns his back. It's somebody who backs off just a little, gives a bit of breathing space between what he, he can see and, um, and what he needs to do. And so it's in this breathing space that we, we can be now can enter into this concept of, of, of the deeper meaning of I can't breathe. And you know, uh, 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 as you've mentioned, I've written this article, and really, what has struck me so much is the immense power, is, is probably the, the right word, in those, in those three words, I can't breathe. It speaks for absolutely every single individual. When you think of, of that, that fetus coming through the birth canal, waiting to be born, the umbilical cord is already separated, the oxygen levels are um, uh, plummeting. That, that fetus cannot breathe, comes into the world, takes its first breath, and after that comes its first scream. I would like to suggest that is the first scream of relief in the life of, a, of an individual. My God, you know, I can breathe. I'm out. There's a new world here. I've outgrown. Um, <laughs> I can breathe. But what, what, what a relief. And... Um, we're now looking at something which um, is important in, in, in my work as, a, as an analyst and psychiatrist, particularly dealing with individuals on a, on a therapeutic basis. And that is linking that metaphor that I can't breathe, not only to its psychological significance, but also to the, um, its ecological and environmental significance. This is, this is incredibly important. So what we're doing here, is we are recognizing that we are living in a year which we are never going to forget. 2020 will go down in the memories of every person who is alive today and capable of, of, a, of sequential memory. We will take this to our graves. Uh, it'll be a, a point of conversation that'll, that will allow us to communicate with people all over the world. Wherever you go to from now, you'll be able to ask the question, by the way, what was 2020 like for you? And we'll all know. So these shared emotions, these shared experiences come out of an event like this. But ultimately, um, 
we were looking at a situation now where we were really having to re-examine our future. And I think what, what sort of struck me out of all of this, um, apart from the way that people stood together, um, was just a recognition of how the, the novelty of the early lockdown started wearing off. And we started, in a way, we started grieving. We were missing a way of life. There was a sense that we needed a bit of fresh air. We needed to get out there. <laughs> and I will never forget the first day um, that they lifted the, the stage four to stage three um, restrictions here in Cape Town. That happened on a Friday. Well, on Saturday, we hit the mountainside here. And I have never seen so many people climbing and walking and hiking in the mountains as I saw on that first Saturday. There's a natural affiliation for fresh air to breathe again. It's in our, it's in our nature. And then, of course, came this event where, where George Floyd is literally, he's murdered. And those incredible words, Mama, I can't breathe. And I think this sparked something that, that um, will always be remembered in, in, in our lives as well. What we've done and what that has done has been more of, 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 um, of a remembering of a particular individual. Um, but it, it is a case of never forgetting those words. Why? Because they mean something to every single one of us. I considered what it's like to be an, an analyst in doing therapeutic work and how really every single individual that comes to see me, deep down, will be expressing some form, some way or manner of saying, I can't breathe. And for example, you being claustrophobic in one's relationship, being paralyzed by political correctness, being suffocating in, in, in a work situation where you're, the workload is overwhelming, a different kind of suffocation, having to live out the expectations of other people. And you can see how this translates right across the line. And that's longing just to find a place where you can breathe and where you can literally be yourself. Well, what about the earth? What is happening now? You were hearing Leslie speaking about these, these incredible fires in, the, in Australia. As I speak, the, the devastation in Northern California right now is something else. Um, mm. This morning, that to see California from space, I'm looking at these satellite pictures, it is devastating. What mm. on earth is happening? And surely the earth itself is saying, I can't breathe. And what is happening here is it is, it is, the, it is the need of human indifference, of our conscious denial, of our sense of entitlement and importance. It is a human knee which is on the throat of the earth right now. So when I hear from you, John, that the individuals who say, we're going to mine that wild coast no matter what. Why? Because this is survival of the fittest and I will have the last word. There is somebody who his knee is on the wild coast itself and watch out because the earth will protest. It will happen. You better, you better be ready for it. So where does this come? Where, what, is, what does this lead to? We have to somewhere find a place for hope. We have somewhere to find a, a language that is able to, to understand that before it's too late, there are things, there are some things that we can do about it. And how will it work out? The answer is we don't actually know. But is it worth a try? Back mm -hmm. to Keystone individuals. Do you have an in you to make a difference? And if so, start now. Begin now. Mm -hmm. Well, Ian, the one audience for this video is my uh, faith community. Um, I'm part of a virtual group now. And lot, yesterday on Sunday, um, we had participants from California. She was describing how people have completely lost their home. And you know, as social workers, we all try and say, well, how do we see what's happening, not only in its literal sense, but in its metaphorical, symbolic sense? And, in this, and I just heard her saying, well, we are losing our home as on the planet by continually exploiting it. So maybe just as a, as a kind of a comfort to them, can you read Fierce, your poem? Well, I think, first of all, I, I will do it, but... This, this poem, I would like to, 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 to recite you with, a, with a, an understanding 
that this is what what is being what we are being called to do. We're being called to fiercely protect the values, mm -hmm. values of what I refer to as uh, being hunter gatherers again, hunter gatherers of values, and to be fierce protectors of those values of unpretentiousness, of freedom, of of of, of immediacy of a sense of autonomy, of elegance, of sensuality. And all of this is about, about wildness and about the, the intrinsic beauty of, of, of landscapes, of, of animals, something that we have forgotten. It is intrinsic to a, a literacy that is ecological, that sense, deep sense of reciprocity between all living things. And if you have that sense of reciprocity, damn it, speak for it, value it, and, and protect it fiercely. So here is the poem, Fierce. I like the word fierce, the way it aligns itself with nakedness and solitude. A fierce nakedness, a fierce solitude, and I like the way it holds the word fire. I like that word fire, the way it ignites the cutting edge in poetry, refusing to be nothing less than a fiery edge, fiery tongue. And I like the way it links to the word wild. I like that word wild. The way it weaves its way between yes and no, refusing to be nothing less than a wild joy, wild anger. And I like the way it nurtures the word fierce. I like that word, fierce. Oh, <laughs> where are my tissues? <laughs> well, thank you. So, you see, this is the beauty of poetry. Poetry says things that's, that prose cannot, that, that political rhetoric cannot. Poetry hits you from behind. Mm -hmm. it, says that it, it comes in ways which remind us that this has got something to do with you and me. And I love that. And poetry, as you know, is not just about rhyme and verse. It's about resonance. It's about mm -hmm. honesty. It's about those classic lines which, which come out earlier today, and I love that about the river. But the river is us. This can't happen. The river yeah. is us. Wow. There is a fierce response to, to what they are saying, and you know, I can tell you right now that that's going to be carried further. The wild coast is us. This yeah. can happen. Right. And I think we also have to remember that whatever we mine, we also undermine. Mm. Paradox there. Whatever you mind, you also undermine. Mm. Let's take that as a mantra to the mining houses. Yeah. Yes. Um, in one of our conversations, I think it was two or three episodes earlier, we were, we were reflecting on metaphors of making sense and meaning out of the COVID. 19 pandemic and one of my friends Marguerite Kutsia had come up who's an anthropologist and a futurist had been playing very much with the idea that we need to reframe this pandemic um, there's the statement that is going around where people are saying that the pandemic did not break the system but rather it has exposed a broken system so we find ourselves in this suspended moment on the one hand, as well as um, the societal fault lines uh, are rapidly you know, surfacing and deepening and we're having to face them quite quickly. Um, so John, as you mentioned, the pandemic is holding up this mirror to society and we're having to confront our realities, memories, imaginings, um, and what makes us human. The dominant narrative, which I'm sure we've seen everywhere, is this idea that the pandemic is a war and the virus is our enemy and we have to do everything in our power to fight this enemy. 
uh, we need to eliminate the threat. Um, it's, you know, it's a threat to human life as well as to national security. Um, and sometimes we're willing to eliminate it even by violent means. Citizens then become soldiers and um, it becomes our duty to fight, uh, to protect ourselves and our country at all costs. Mm. Then we've got the environmental realm. So the dominant narrative that we're seeing here is the pandemic as disaster. Um, it's this idea of a disruptive collapse. Um, you know, it's a, either a natural process or it's by human influence. Um, and what uh, governments are trying to do is put regulations into place as if, you know, trying to minimize the damage or to control the spread of this disease. Um, and the problem here is that people um, kind of become victims um, or volunteers rather than being agents of change. A more positive metaphor that could be used here in the environmental realm is this idea of pandemic as a river. Um, what this then does is that the idea of healing becomes a journey. And in order to make it through this journey, you need to develop a map to navigate the landscape. But it's also important to consider who created the map, who is the map for, and what is the intention of the map. Um, so you want to be able to anticipate any emergencies or turbulence, um, but you also want it to be able to adapt to the changing landscape. And what happens here then is people become explorers who are able to go on their own path or connect with others. So it's more of a collaborative journey. So the main point here is that many of the dominant pandemic metaphors encourage destructive discourses and promote ideas of separation or superiority. The emerging metaphors are more transformational um, that promote interconnectedness and a process of change. They are different ways of seeing, framing and being in the world and the language we use and the metaphors we apply shape the way we experience reality and imagine possibilities and take on responsibility. Your image of uh, a river got me thinking about uh, another pandemic or epidemic which uh, happened in 1976. Ironically, while there was an outbreak of another kind in Soweto, there was an outbreak of a disease called Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't for some time called Ebola. It didn't have a name. It was given that name by one of the uh, epidemiologists from the Centers for Disease Control in the States, uh, who was in the Congo. And one evening, he and uh, some friends, epidemiologists, were drinking Kentucky bourbon in vast quantities and were casting about for a name and they couldn't really find one very easily. So they then hit on the name of the, the river that was nearest Yambuku, uh, the town where the outbreak uh, had happened. Uh, so Ebola is a river and what I find interesting about a river, and it, it picks up, Marguerite, on, on some of the points you're making here, is that it flows regardless. You know, we, we can try and dam it up, we can try and alter its course, but there's a, an inexorability about the flow of a river. That got me thinking. I think that's an interesting idea. And, and the other one that I find really interesting, I'm, I'm not sure if you know of Stephen Jenkinson. He's a Canadian, he's a social worker and a theologian. You'll like him, John. <laughs> um, he describes COVID as a rough god, which I thought was really interesting also in the context of his work. He um, says he worked in the death trade. He worked in palliative care. Um, and his contention is that we have created a death-denying culture. And so we constantly hold on to this false hope of immortality. 
and we don't actually face death and the way in which that impoverishes us. He talks about how we live in an age of grievance and we don't deal with grief. And he talks a lot about how if you fully embrace grief and go and experience it, that creates the conditions for a deep appreciation. And I think that, for me, is certainly one of the things that COVID is bringing to us, is that, that awareness that we might die or that those that we love might die. Um, and, in fact, if we think about it for a minute longer, that we all will eventually die. But it is showing us all these things, um, that being one of them. I noticed even in myself, and a number of years ago, I was very ill in intensive care. And I noticed when I came home that the whole, the whole world had become so exquisitely beautiful. Like I was noticing the edge on every leaf, the tiniest little drop of rain, um, the, the grains of soil um, and seeing how intensely beautiful it all was and to the extent that I cried and I noticed with this virus issue that clearly I kind of returned to that state of awareness because mostly we were running around being busy and the, the fact that we had to stay home and slow down really made me appreciate things differently. Even washing the dishes became a blissful activity. <laughs> I think that's a good point to bring this thing to wrap it up because um, you're talking about death and what COVID has done for us. And this is really, I'd like Ian, if he could read Deliverance and tell us that story. And I'd really almost think I don't want to say any more. And if there's anything that people can take away from this video, I would want them to be able to exactly echo what you've just said, Leslie. I've just recently had to have heart surgery and very conscious that, you know, life is fragile. And it comes and goes, but the real, tra the real opportunity inherent in this COVID context is to embrace and to choose life. Well, thank you. This little recital here will certainly flow from what Leslie has just shared with us. More especially this, the fact that we're this death-denying species mm -hmm. and, and how um, the denial of dying and death actually diminishes us. Why? Because it's so often it's out of, out of dying and that process of death that, a lot, that, that something else is born. Beauty is born. Mm. Compassion is reinforced and, and reborn. And intelligence comes out of, out of dying as well. There's different ways of, of understanding the connections. And I think here, mm. if, if we could just really just recognize the deep continuity of, of death and dying in our lives and where on a biological level that it's essential that we have decomposition. It mm -hmm. is it's an absolute continuum of all, of all life itself. And that birth, death, rebirth, and the patterns, the patterns that connect us. Nobody knows for sure what happens to us when we die. But one thing we do know is that memories exist. There are patterns of connections, there are sounds, there are smells, there are the senses of the, of the presence of that individual comes alive in someone else. And so I'll, I want to recite this poem to you, which is, in fact, one of the very first poems I ever wrote. And it was the only poem I wrote for years and years, and it kind of reminds me of that sense of that poetry comes from God knows where. And it goes to God knows where. Mm -hmm. In other words, you don't sit down and just say, right, today I'm going to write a poem. It moves you. It comes through you and it demands to be written. And if you don't, well, you're going to lose it. 
Well, the background to this is that I was, a, it was in my early days as a doctor at a hospital up in the, on the west coast of South Africa. And I was tending to a man who uh, was dying of bronchial carcinoma. And he was really in his last hours. But I was also, being a general practitioner, I was also involved in antenatal work and, and obstetrics, okay? And well, I got this call while I was at his bedside, just, just monitoring his condition. I got a call from one of the nursing sisters to say that this particular patient was ready to deliver. So I, had, I left him, went to the, um, the delivery room, and saw this lady through the birth of her first child. Out came this child, 10 fingers, 10 toes, all was well. Got it all wrapped up and then sent it off down towards the, the, the nursery, which is close by, and the child would then obviously join its mother, once the mother had been, had been attended to. I then went back to the, um, to the room where this dying man was lying, and really within, within a few minutes of being there, he took his last breath. And as he took his last breath, I heard the sound of this child, this newborn child crying down the corridor. And the, the link was just absolutely uh, inevitable. You know, mm. you'd have to, I think you'd have to be solidly numb not to make some kind of connection and wonder what on earth this is all about. And so I wrote this poem called Deliverance. Tonight is my night, she said. I can feel it deep inside. And tonight is my night, he said. I can feel there's nowhere to hide. The pain comes and goes, she said. This life deep inside moves about. The pain comes and goes, he said. This life deep inside is out. My breathing is deep, she said, with labor. So much pain in my breathing. It's pain, he said. I am not labor again. I am ripe to deliver, she said. I can feel it all below. But I am ripe to deliver, he said. There is a need deep inside. Let go. Oh, what a song, she said. It is life. The young child cried. Oh, what a song, he said. It is life. And that old body died. That's deliverance. That's the, these are the cycles that's, that connect us, that stop us in our tracks, that, that salute an enormous and beautiful mystery of life. Mm. Thank you.